this program. Viewer discretion is advised. You're listening to Odd I See, A Tale from the Road, an audiobook by Christopher Colon. All rights reserved. Any resemblance to persons living or dead are purely coincidental. Chapter 23 The three hours passed, going over old times and trying to get Eddie to come with us. He wasn't. We went back down to the park and saw Bruce standing there leaning on his guitar case almost like a crutch. We're here, Bruce I announced to the blind man. Andy if this is a trap, you won't have to worry about Arnie's men killing you, because I'll do it first. Shut the fuck up Corey it felt so good coming out of my mouth. Gentlemen Bruce said in his gravely voice I have procured our transportation. If I'm not mistaken, he will be waiting for us on the southwest corner of the park follow me. Talk about the blind leading the blind. We didn't know where we were going and we we following an honest for goodness blind man. As we got to the corner, there was only one vehicle there. There was a sweet irony for the vehicle that was going to take us away from this place of death. It was a hearse. For a second it reminded me of the Cadillacs that Arnie's men drove, but at least I knew, there was plenty of room for us. As we approached I recognized the music playing on the car's stereo. It was the classic rock band Styx, playing their song. As the driver saw Bruce and us he lowered the music, reached over and opened the passenger door. Eddie had walked with us. Part of me wanted to knock him out and take us with him against his will, but that was a little extreme. Besides, he would freak out once he regained consciousness, so I put that idea out of my head. I still wanted to try to get him to safety. When all of this is over with, I'm coming back to get you. I said to Eddie with my eyes watering. Andy, you can't rescue someone who doesn't need saving. I'll probably be gone by then, anyway. Don't say that, a tear made its way down my cheek. I tell you what, take this Eddie took of his misfits hoodie, and handed it to me. I can't take this. This is your most favorite thing in the world. I refused to grab it. He forced it into my hands Andy, my most favorite thing comes in a syringe. It's not this hoodie. Let's just say that I'm lending it to you. My father once told me, that if somebody owes you something, you'll never die broke. This hoodie is my one worldly possession. If you hold on to it, I won't die broke. I promise, that you can give it back when we meet again. You mean if we meet again? I said sadly. Now you're seeing where I'm coming from. Don't worry about me. Just think about where I am, before you see somebody else make the same mistakes I have. I will. I'm sorry I let you down. You had nothing to do with it. Don't think that this is in any way your fault. I let myself down. I forced to live with the decisions I made. He said. Please take care of yourself. I was so close to being a blubbering fool. I will. Now go. We said our goodbyes and I got in the back of the hearse with Jimmy and Corey. There was plenty of space for all of us. Bruce sat up front with the Mohawk sporting driver. Dimitri took the guest of honor spot in the cargo area, usually reserved for coffins. This wasn't a hearse employed by a funeral home. No, the eccentric owner, had customized the hearse for his own pleasure. The outside was about as polished and cared for as any of the cars that Arnie's men drove. Except this vehicle was supposed to carry dead bodies, as opposed to the unfortunate victims that ended up in the trunks of the thugs Cadillacs. There were decorative lights on the inside of the cabin, and the seats were upholstered in a luxurious velvet-like material. A small skull hung from the rear view mirror. Surely the owner had a morbid sense of humor. I could appreciate that. Sorry about the mess back there. People usually complain about the garbage I keep in the back of my ride. I don't care, because I don't sit back there. The driver said laughing to himself. There were fast food wrappers, and, what appeared to be, parking tickets lining the floor of the hearse. There were boxes in the back that shifted and hit Dimitri every time the hearse made a turn. One thing I noticed was Weasel Comics comic book. I've been reading those things since I was a kid. I picked it up and flipped some of the pages. I wasn't really reading it, I was just breezing through it. There was something comforting about holding it in my hands. The familiar feeling of the paper stock, and its vibrant colors in the comic brought me back to a simpler time, when I was a kid, just reading about adventures, like the one I was having. It gave me a new perspective on the hero. I'd much rather, right now, be a kid sitting in a room reading about this, than be the one actually living Trophet. I looked down at the ratty hoodie that Eddie had given me, and remembered how much life can suck. 
Hey cousin, I can do a lot of things. But one of them isn't red mines. So unless you want me driving in circles all day, why don't you tell me where we're going? I didn't realize the driver was talking to me. I was so lost in my thoughts about Eddie and everything, I had forgotten that I was the leader. I would like to follow someone else for a little while. Give my mind a brief vacation. It took a moment for me to snap out of my haze and told the driver how to get to Layla's house. He rudely thanked me. All right Bruce, I'm holding up my end of the bargain. Now it's time for you to help us. I said to the blind man. Corey spoke up, should we be discussing this in front of him? Referring to the driver. There's no need to worry about Zach Bruce answered. I'm sure anything we discuss, he will keep confidential. And why is that old man? Do you know him that well? Corey said snidely. Zach the hearse driver said it's because, he's already bought my loyalty. Your blind buddy has promised me his guitar, in exchange for the ride I'm giving you guys. Where are you guys going and why isn't my business? So go ahead and discuss whatever. I've burnt my brain cells out a long time ago. I can keep a secret, because I'll forget it anyway. I was taken by surprise Bruce. Is he telling the truth? That guitar is priceless, and you're trading it in for a lousy ride? Have you lost your mind? Bruce answered that guitar was the only thing I had in the world. But it means nothing to me, if I can't be without my Layla. She's the only family I have. Now, that I know where to find her, I have to go be with her. Don't worry about the value of my guitar. Because not only have I bought the ride to Layla's house, Zach is also going to drive you to the Ray Del Sol Casino, after you drop me off at Layla's. It was a lot to take in. It baffled my mind, why is he driving us to the casino? You want to take down Arnie Ellis? Right. I didn't like where Bruce was going with this. Yes. I answered hesitantly. You have to go to the casino and talk to Layla's father. He practically lives there, so you have to go there and talk to him personally. That's the only way you're going to reach him. On the night that Arnie Ellis went to the casino he was talking with the guy that was supposed to handle the transaction. The guy that ended up killing the federal agents. I obviously can't give you an eyewitness account, because I never saw the guy. But I'll never forget the guy's voice. It was this nasal high pitch voice. So what you got to do, is go to the casino and look at the security camera footage of whoever it was that was sitting and talking to the whale in the main room of the casino. I remember it was around 9 o'clock at night. So that should help you narrow it down. Get the security footage, identify the guy, and I'll come forward with what I know to the cops. There's no way that punk is going to go down by himself. He'll snitch to the cops on all of Arnie Ellis' operations. And the whale will be out of your hair, and Layla's. Once again, Corey spoke out of turn so that's all that you're offering? We do all the legwork and then you'll come forward? You could have told us that back in the park and save us a whole lot of trouble. Not that you're really helping us. Now you got us driving to your precious little girl's house. How do you know she's going to take you in you old fool? I hope she rejects you. I hope she tells you to go sleep in the streets like the dog you are. I'm glad you were stupid enough to trade away your guitar for this useless information. You'll still be homeless, except in another town and without your precious guitar. She will take me in, son. You've never loved anyone before or had anyone love you, and it shows. It's that nasty attitude of yours, that keeps you from ever loving anyone. And that will be your downfall. Then Bruce addressed me, Andy if you're smart, you will get rid of this knucklehead real soon, before he drags you down with him. I'm glad Bruce didn't think I was endorsing Corey's attitude you're not the first one to give me that advice. Hell, you're not the first one this week to give me that advice. Corey looked at me fiercely, and what the fuck is that supposed to mean? It means, for the second time, shut the fuck up. Bruce didn't have to help us at all. And he's sacrificing his one worldly possession to get us one step closer to getting home and out of trouble with the whale. You haven't contributed one helpful action since this whole thing started. So do the one thing you're good at, and that's follow my lead. And stay the fuck out of my way. Things calmed down. Tempers had flared and waned. Thank goodness Jimmy was sitting between us or I might have gone back to choking Corey again. There was no talking, just the music lightly playing in the car speakers. The driver must have really liked the band sticks, because that's all that was playing on the radio. He must have been listening to their greatest hits album. 
I went back thumbing through the comic book and it helped relax me. Bruce was right about Layla. She practically pounced on him when she opened her door and saw all of us waiting in the hallway. She looked a lot better than she did, when we left her. She was taking her pills, and was in the right state of mind. I was almost jealous of Bruce for the moment I saw her embrace him. She loved him like a father, but still, now that she backed to reality, I wanted her to throw her arms around me like that. The funny thing was that we never told Bruce what Layla did for a living. I could only imagine him stumbling around the apartment grasping at sex toys and S&M furniture, trying to feel his way around. When I mentioned to Layla that Bruce had traded his guitar for our ride, she quickly went to her bedroom and came out with some cash to pay off the driver the value of the guitar, which was quite hot. Bruce tried to argue against her doing it, but she said that she couldn't live with the fact of Bruce living without his guitar. Without that guitar, he might die before we need him to come forth and testify. That would put a nasty wrinkle in our plans. Having his guitar back was like watching a father reunited with his children. He got Layla back, now his prized guitar. He honestly wasn't expecting it back, and cried when he held it in his hands. I asked him if I could hold the guitar and he obliged. I started shredding through some chords and watched his face light up. He was impressed. Then he asked for the guitar back. Wouldn't you know it, Sinovovich, he played everything I just played, note for note. If I'm not mistaken, he played it faster than me. There was still some things I still needed to learn. There would be no heavy metal if the blues never existed. And I was getting a crash course. Please visit twostrangersonepodcast.net.